the pancreas is a very interesting organ because it has not only an exocrine function, but it also has an endocrine function. The exocrine pancreas is what you may have already learned about when you've learned about digestion and digestive enzymes that are put into the digestive tract by the exocrine pancreas. But our focus in the next couple of days is going to be, in part, the endocrine pancreas. And so if we look closely at the endocrine pancreas, we see that it's predominantly arranged into structures that we would call islets. These are uh, formally known as islets of Langerhans. <coughs> Excuse me. And if you look a little bit deeper into these islets, you'll see that there's actually several cell types that make up the islets. And they're labeled for you here in the right portion of the figure as alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and F cells. Now, this figure is drawn to make you think that all of these cells are kind of equally distributed within the islet, but as we're going to see in the next slide, while um, G cells, delta cells, and F cells are very important in terms of kind of hormones that they produce, um, in terms of diabetes, the alpha cells and the beta cells are going to be primarily uh, the cells we're going to discuss. And so we're going to turn to the next slide. And we're going to introduce each of the cell types in terms of their physiological purpose. And so the alpha cell is actually quite intriguing uh, in the story of diabetes. It's involved in the production of glucagon, and glucagon is used to raise blood glucose levels. It does so in part by increasing the rate of glycogen breakdown and glucose release from the liver. So this is a pro-glucose signal. On the other hand, the beta cells produce the hormone insulin, and insulin is what we would call the anti-diabetic hormone, right? It's the signal that lowers blood glucose levels, <laughs> and it does so by stimulating glucose uptake into target tissues, for example, like skeletal muscle. Um, but a lot of people kind of overlook the fact that the beta cell produces another hormone. Sometimes it's called IAPP, which stands for islet-associated polypeptide. But it's also known as amylin. And amylin is another hormone released by the beta cell that... Uh, in the past 15 or 20 years has actually been developed into a therapeutic um, material for the treatment of diabetes, which we'll discuss um, when we get to other injectables beyond insulin. Okay, so I want you to remember the beta cells not only make insulin, but they make amylin. If we look further in the islet, the delta cell produces a hormone called somatostatin, and you may have learned about somatostatin in, in anatomy and physiology. Um, it's um, a very important uh, secretory inhibitor. Uh, and here we see it in uh, the endocrine pancreas as well. Uh, another place we see somatostatin uh, is, in the, is in the brain, uh, particularly in the pituitary gland. Um, but um, here we're going to not really focus much more than what we've already discussed. Uh, concerning somatostatin. The F cells produce a hormone called pancreatic peptide, and this hormone uh, has effects on the gallbladder. Uh, it also regulates the production of some of the pancreatic enzymes that are used uh, to aid in digestion. And last but not least are the G cells, uh, and these cells produce the hormone gastrin. I mentioned previously that the representation of these different cell types in the pancreatic islet, which is part of the endocrine pancreas, is not actually um, you know, homogeneous. In fact, the most abundant cell in the pancreatic islet is the beta cell, coming in at about 75% of the islet mass. And that's... Uh, 
pointing to the alpha cell representation. The alpha cell representation is about 20%. The beta cell representation is about 75%. So these two cell types make up about 95% of the endocrine pancreas. And again, uh, we see here on the far column that the alpha cells are involved in making glucagon. The beta cells are involved in making insulin and amylin. And you may see these... Um, if you look at the far right, you see these words that start with pro, pro-glucagon, pro-insulin. These are pro-hormones that have to be cleaved into the final active hormone that we know as glucagon or as insulin. And I'll, I'll discuss that in a moment uh, in terms of insulin. Um, again, the delta cells, as you can see, only 3 to 5% of the pancreatic islet and the G cells and the F cells are uh, very low abundance, but still making important hormonal substances that affect digestion. Now, there are some other important secretory factors that can affect blood glucose, aside from just glucagon or insulin. And one of these that we should definitely think about um, are, are agents such as epinephrine, which is a catecholamine, and we know epinephrine is produced in the adrenal medulla, and it does lots of things, right? It's involved in the fight-or-flight response. It, it's a very good and potent bronchodilator. <coughs> Excuse me. You know it has effects on your heart. You know it's also known by its old name, adrenaline. But in terms of sugar... We have to realize that the fight-or-flight response requiring energy to come into your muscles. So here we're going to see sugar being released from the liver. And um, the uh, process of that occurring is called glycogenolysis. Glycogenolysis. In fact, there's two ways that the liver can release sugar. One is called glycogenolysis breaking down the storage form glycogen, but the, the other form, the other way is called gluconeogenesis. And in gluconeogenesis, um, you know, we're making, actually making uh, glucose de novo here. But I, I'm kind of getting beyond myself. Um, why do we think about these other important secretory factors like epinephrine? Because epinephrine affects blood glucose levels. We also see epinephrine is involved in lipolysis. And lipolysis is an important process because it begins the energy-producing pathway called um, fatty acid oxidation, right? So we can use fatty acids for energy. So remember, this is the hormone of stress. You know, I'm trying to avoid a threat. I need energy. I need to get out of the way. Cortisol, another adrenal gland product, but here the cortex is making cortisol, and you know cortisol is a, a type of glucocorticoid, and why is it called glucocorticoid? Because one of the things it does, yes, it's immunosuppressing and such, the, all those things you've learned about, but cortisol um, antagonizes the action of insulin, it targets tissues, and it promotes gluconeogenesis in the liver. So uh, this gluconeogenesis, the new genesis or the new synthesis of sugar um, by the liver and release into the blood elevates blood glucose a little bit. So this is why, you know, if you have a patient who's on systemic glucocorticoid therapy for some kind of inflammatory disease, um, that can impact their, uh, their blood glucose levels. Okay, so we're going to keep that one in mind. Thirdly, we have GLP-1. And GLP-1 is a hormone released from the gut. It's a gut hormone, and it has a kind of a peculiar name. GLP-1 stands for glucagon-like peptide. Um, and it looks like glucagon uh, if you look at it on the amino acid level, but it doesn't actually act like glucagon. Remember, glucagon is involved in raising blood glucose, uh, and GLP-1 is involved in decreasing blood glucose. So it's it looks a lot like glucagon, but it doesn't act like glucagon. Okay, so GLP-1. And this is actually a whole type of, of drug class now called GLP-1 mimics. Um, uh, so we're going to discuss them um, 
um, when we get to other injectables beyond insulin. Okay, so we see GLP-1 produced by the gut. It increases beta cell mass, which is important because beta cells are the cells that release insulin. And let us not forget that GLP-1 is involved in delaying gastric emptying, which slows down the rate of absorption of sugar. It, it, it produces a feeling of fullness, so there's a decreased food intake, and um, there's a decreased release of glucagon, which is a pro-sugar, right? Elevate sugar signal. So GLP-1 may be causing some confusion at this moment, um, but you, th you should think of it as an anti-diabetic agent, lowering blood glucose, which is not what glucagon does, right? The glucagon increases blood glucose. Now, uh, the upper left panel represents just the HNE stained um, section of pancreas. And as you can see, actually, most of that section would be considered exocrine. But the black arrow is pointing to the island or the islet of Langerhans, which is then in the lower panels stained preferentially for either glucagon or insulin. Right? So this brownish red looking stuff is either a specific stain for glucagon or a specific stain for insulin. And this just confirms what, what I've already mentioned a few minutes ago, that the majority of cells in the pancreatic islet are the insulin-producing beta cells. But, um, you know, the alpha cells are nothing to sniff at. You know, there's a certain representation of them there, and they're involved in making glucagon. And so now, um, when we think about normal blood glucose levels, what, what will they be um, in a person who hasn't eaten for a few hours, sometimes referred to as the fasted state? Um, well, depending on, on, the, on the person, on average, a fasting plasma glucose level could be anywhere from 70 to 110 uh, mg percent or milligrams per deciliter. And, um, of course, Dr. Tori may, may refine these numbers slightly. But um, for our purposes, we're going to think normal, high, and low. And so for normal, we're going to consider 70 to 110. For high, we're going to be thinking blood glucose is like 130, 140, 150, 160, 200, 300 mg per deciliter. That would be hyperglycemia. And for low blood glucose levels, we'll be thinking less than 70, things like 50 or 60 mg per deciliter, which causes hypo or too low blood sugar. Right? So um, keep this in mind as we move forward uh, with the realization that, you know, Dr. Tori, who uh, practices uh, with, uh, with the newest uh, diabetic uh, interventions, uh, you know, he might shave a few numbers off this range, but generally speaking, a, a fasting glucose should look something like 70 to 110 mg per deciliter. So when you have blood glucose levels above 110 um, persistently, I mean, they go above 110 when you eat an apple, right? You eat an apple, your blood sugar goes up, but then it comes back down. Why? Because your pancreas releases insulin. And insulin helps your blood sugar go down. In fact, if it goes down too much, you've got glucagon as a correction factor. Release a little glucagon from the pancreas, and it'll bring it back up to what we would consider, you know, um, normal glucose levels. And so that whole process might take an hour, two hours, something, something to this degree after eating a meal. This is why if you eat all day long, just nonstop eating all day long, uh, you're stimulating insulin all day long out of your pancreas. And so um, one way to maybe think about diabetes is trying to take the stress off your pancreas. Take the stress off your pancreas. How do you do that? Well, you know, by not overeating. I mean, obviously, there's a certain number of calories each day that we should consume based on our body mass and such. But uh, chronic overeating is going to cause your pancreas to chronically overproduce insulin, and that could be a problem for reasons we'll discuss later. But um, let's just get back to the kind of the basics here. So uh, 
the, the, this, the disorder of metabolism that results in hyperglycemia, sometimes referred to as diabetes mellitus. And um, diabetes mellitus is either a relative or an absolute deficiency of insulin, or it's metabolic action, meaning the body makes the insulin, but the body doesn't respond as much to it as it should. When your body makes insulin, and your pancreas makes it, but your body doesn't respond to it like it used to, that's called insulin resistance. And so your pancreas needs to make more insulin to get the job done than it did before. So relative or absolute deficiency of insulin or its metabolic action referred to as diabetes mellitus. There's generally two types of diabetes mellitus that we uh, talk about. There are other types, but the, the, the predominant types are type 1 and type 2. Um, another important type is uh, called gestational diabetes, but um, we won't discuss it uh, too much um, as we as we go through this, this disease first time. But... Um, the acute effects of untreated diabetes can be life-threatening, and depending on the type of diabetes you have, you can either see ketoacidosis, uh, which is a big accumulation of uh, what we call ketone bodies, um, things like acetone, um, hydroxybutyrate. They can acidify the blood, and acidifying the blood is a, a dangerous condition. Um, and this is usually going to be... Um, you know, due to a complete deficiency in insulin. The other acute effect that you have to keep your eye on is the type 2 diabetic who, like I said, has some insulin. They Their beta cells are intact, but perhaps their body has become resistant uh, to the effects of insulin, so it doesn't work as well as it should. And so chronic hyperglycemia, chronic hyperglycemia, Sugar likes to hold on to water. You get this hyperosmolar condition that can cause coma. Okay. So these are acute effects, uh, kind of uh, very uh, serious acute effects that needs that need to be uh, addressed uh, urgently. Um, chronic effects are, are also bad. So we see microvascular. Um, we see renal complications, neuropathies, infection. Uh, risk goes up. So in a, in a poorly controlled diabetic, it's very common to see uh, atherosclerosis of, of the blood vessels kind of accelerated compared to a, someone who's a non-diabetic patient, all other things being equal. Um, this, this chronic hyperglycemia starts to affect the kidney, can cause renal complications. Those glomeruli uh, can actually be disrupted by, um, you know, excess glucose chronically. Uh, neuropathy, um, you know, diabetics, uh, particularly poorly controlled diabetics, they start to, you know, they start to get neuropathies. Um, you know, they might step on something sharp and not feel that. Um, you know, and, and sensation of of, of stimulus. Uh, so a lot of the patients that are uh, chronic diabetics are going to be assessed for. Um, you know, sensation of, of, the, of the digits and the toes and the feet. Um, you, you've probably heard that um, in some cases, um, diabetics need amputation. And that can be due to a combined effect of microvascular, macrovascular toxicity, as well as um, infection and, and, and necrosis of the tissue that's not being well perfused. And so this is always a, a big concern. So you know, you've heard Dr. Resnick, I'm sure, talk about this by now, uh, and you're going to also hear Dr. Tory talk about this. But, you know, there is a lot to be lost by ignoring hyperglycemia, and there's a lot to be gained by correcting it, correcting hyperglycemia. Uh, and so the, um, you know, one of the most prevalent diseases, chronic diseases right now in the West is diabetes. And um, so... You're going to see lots and lots of the drugs we're going to discuss in this unit uh, on a daily basis because of the sheer prevalence of the disease. Okay, so we definitely want to understand the basic disease processes, but uh, I'm going to move forward um, and start to start to get us ready for uh, discussion of the drugs that's coming. Again, this slide just reminds us of the kinds of things that can happen in the diabetic patient, okay? Um, 
from a macrovascular scale, uh, coronary artery disease, peripheral artery disease, stroke. Of course, that's a, a macro scale, microvascular scale, blood vessels um, that perfuse the extremities, that perfuse the eye, uh, uh, neur neuropathy, uh, peripheral neuropathy down there at the feet, uh, sometimes at the hands, um, loss of legs or feet due to amputation, uh, sexual dysfunction, uh, diabetes, big, big um, um, uh, contributor to um, erectile dysfunction in males. Uh, and so, like I said, there's lots of reasons why we want to correct hyperglycemia, and this slide summarizes those reasons. So the idea is, if we can correct hyperglycemia, we can delay or prevent these conditions from happening. So how do we know about somebody's blood glucose levels? Well, the, uh, the way we know is through blood tests. Right? You do a finger prick, you do an invasive kind of approach where you've got to get some blood. And there's two really ways of um, assessing a person's uh, glucose status. One is the in-the-moment test, which is your, your plasma glucose level at the moment. Right? So this is the finger prick test where you find out what the patient's blood glucose level is in the moment. But then there's a second uh, parameter that's looked at called glycosylated or glycated hemoglobin. Sometimes it's referred to as Hg for hemoglobin A1c, which refers to the glycosylation of the hemoglobin. So glycosylation in this regard is a non-enzymatic reaction where there's just a lot of sugar around and it can start to bind the hemoglobin covalently. And so in a situation where there's excess glucose in the blood, the hemoglobin gets glycosylated. And so where is the hemoglobin? It's in the red blood cell. The red blood cell circulates for about four months in the body. So a glycosylated hemoglobin level gives you an approximate blood glucose level in the patient over about four months. Right, so um, the finger prick glucose level in the moment, you know, right now after eating lunch, versus the glycosylated hemoglobin, which is a picture of the last three to four months. And so if you look here at the bottom of this slide, a glycosylated hemoglobin percentage of seven uh, comes out to be a average glucose level of about 154 mg per deciliter, uh, which is considered starting to be high. Right, uh, on the high end. Uh, hemoglobin A1C of 6 trans translates into about 126 mg per deciliter. And Dr. Torrey is going to talk to you more about these HGA1C levels and, and how they correlate with, with um, treatment outcomes and such, or I should say how treatment outcomes correlate with reducing these. But what I just want to mention to you is this is a, a four-month picture of what's been going on in your patient. So if a patient comes to see you, and at the moment their blood glucose levels are great, um, but their uh, their glycosylated hemoglobin levels are above eight or nine. I mean, you know, you know they haven't really been complying, or they have been complying, and the drug's not working, right? So uh, not to belabor the point, but the glycosylated hemoglobin is an index of where your patient's at in terms of glycemic control. Right? How are they doing? Um, and so I'm sure that Dr. Torrey will expand upon this, but um, I just wanted to introduce this idea. So again, we've talked about insulin now as the hormone that's going to move the sugar into the cells. And so I'd like to call your attention to this picture where at the very bottom we have a circle that says homeostasis. And homeostasis would be normal glucose levels. So the glucose levels ranging here, 70 to 110 mg per deciliter. And something happens to disturb homeostasis, like you've eaten a meal, right? You've had a donut, or you've uh, ingested an apple, or you've had some applesauce, or, or whatever. You, you've eaten something. 
homeostasis is disturbed. Blood glucose levels are going up because the glucose is being absorbed across the gut. And so those beta cells will secrete insulin in response to this homeostasis disturbed. And that insulin is going to have multiple effects. It's going to increase the rate of glucose transport into target cells, like skeletal muscle. It's going to increase the rate of glucose utilization and ATP generation in target cells like skeletal muscle. <laughs> Excuse me. It's going, to, it's going to cause the glucose that's now being put into cells, target cells, to be stored as glycogen. It's going to take amino acids and store them into proteins. It's going to take triglycerides and, and you know, fatty acids and store them into triglycerides. So insulin is a storage hormone. Store, 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 right? The cells are storing things for a rainy day. It's like, uh, it's like when the squirrels are running around right now in the autumn trying to find lots of nuts and they dig them under the ground and they, they, they're going to come back for those nuts when it gets cold in the winter and they're hungry, storing them for a later day. So insulin is storage, 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 right? The body grows. Insulin's called sometimes a growth factor. And I'm sure Dr. Resnick showed you the picture of the girl who was type 1 diabetic and she was very, uh, she was wasting away and, and her body mass was very, very low. And when insulin was discovered and she was given the treatment, she started to gain muscle mass, right? She started to gain fat. She started to um, grow. Right, so insulin is intricately involved in in growth, and that's the important aspect that we're going to discuss later. Um, but anyway, now as that blood glucose concentration declines, we have homeostasis restored, and the pancreas stops releasing insulin until it needs to do so again. So this is what's normally happening in what we call the the homeostatic control of blood glucose. Okay. You get into problems when this homeostasis gets disturbed, right? So a person becomes insulin resistant or they're insulin deficient. Now their their new set point isn't 110 mg per deciliter, but their body can only get them to 160 mg per deciliter. You get into trouble if you overdo the dose of insulin, and now all of a sudden, instead of bringing the blood sugar back to 70 to 110, you've dropped your patient down to 50, and they're in hypoglycemia. That's That's a problem, too. All right, so I like I, I, I designed this slide many years ago to try to show you the balance and, and how this is a homeostatic mechanism uh, with the idea of kind of focusing here on insulin's effects. Ultimately, it moving sugar into cells so that sugar can be used or stored. And in addition to that, we see amino acids moving into target cells and being stored into larger structures called proteins. We see fatty acids going into target cells like fat tissue and being stored as triglycerides. On this slide, I'm going to point out several of the targets for anti-diabetes drugs. These targets are going to be designed at clearing glucose out of the blood, and there are different ways by which we can do that. The first on this slide are a class of drug called alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. Now, the Glucosidase enzymes are really a family of enzymes um, on the brush border of the gut. And what they do is they cleave complex carbohydrates into simpler monomeric carbohydrates that can be absorbed. Okay? So um, ACE tells you it's an enzyme. Glucosidase means that it cleaves complex sugars into simpler sugars that are easier to absorb. And so those sugars get absorbed into the blood, and they increase the levels of blood glucose. So alpha-glucosidase inhibitor is going to prevent the breakdown from complex carbohydrate to simpler and easier to absorb carbohydrate. You see? So if you block that, what happens to blood glucose levels? It doesn't go up as much. Yes? Okay. Well, the other, an, another way to clear glucose out of the blood into target tissues would be to give insulin to a patient. Right? 
So, <laughs> excuse me, um, exogenous insulin means administering insulin from the outside of the body, exo-exogenous, into the patient. Right, so a patient taking an injection of insulin. And what kind of injections are mostly uh, used for the administration of insulin? Are they IV injections usually, or are they sub-Q usually? Right, which of the two is usually the case? Okay, very good. So exogenous insulin can cause glucose to clear out of the blood and enter target tissues. Now, sulfonylureas and meglitinides represent other classes of drug that cause the beta cell to release more insulin uh, than it otherwise would. And so sometimes these drugs are called insulin secretors or insulin releasers or insulin secretagogues. Right, sulfonylureas and meglitinides. So, you know, when we get to the drug portion of, of our lecture, um, and really it's going to end up being two lectures. We're going to talk about several members in these classes. Now, the drug diazoxide is actually an inhibitor of insulin secretion. Okay, so um, diazoxide is a drug that's going to block the release of insulin. It's going to promote uh, a condition where, um, you know, you well, it's going to be useful in treating a certain type of, of tumor called insulinoma, which is a rare tumor, which causes hypoglycemia. And um, I'm really not going to talk about diazoxide here, okay? Uh, you may have learned about it in other classes, but uh, that will be one that we don't talk about. Um, so to review where we are, alpha-glucosidase inhibitors as a class uh, slow down the absorption of glucose from the GI tract. Exogenously administered insulin causes it causes sugar like glucose to enter target tissues. So final ureas meglitinides are sometimes called insulin secretagogues or insulin releasers, and they cause beta cell to release more insulin than it otherwise would. By the way, would a sulfonylurea work particularly effectively in a type 1 diabetic where the beta cells are, are destroyed? Very good, right? Not going to be particularly useful in a type 1 diabetic, but will be very useful in people that have type 2 diabetes. Now, down here where the yellow stars are, uh, represent the major uh, target tissues for the hormone insulin. We see the muscle is going to bring that glucose in in the presence of insulin and convert it to glycogen. We see that the fat is going to take that glucose in and it's going to start to convert um, fatty acids into triglycerides, right, a storage form of fat. We see in the liver cell, we see glucose coming in, being converted to glycogen. Um, and so that's important uh, effect of insulin as well. And at the very bottom of the slide, you see um, two more drug classes, the biguanides, which um, inhibit gluconeogenesis in the liver, is an important effect. Um, and the thiazolidine dions, which act as agonists of a type of nuclear receptor called PPAR gamma. And so um, we're going to discuss all of these drugs in the uh, pharmacology uh, slides that lie ahead. Uh, but I liked this slide here because it really sets the table for the drug classes we're about to talk about, the target tissues, and so on. Now, the first type of drug we're going to discuss on Thursday is insulin, All right, just insulin as a replacement therapy. And so what do we know about insulin? Well, it's a, it's a protein. It's a small protein. Uh, it has a molecular weight of about 6,000 Daltons. Uh, and it's composed of two chains that are held together by disulfide bonds. In the upper right panel, you can see those two chains. One is in blue and one is in green. As you can see, they're arranged um, uh, in proximity to each other. Uh, the blue chain would be called the, the A chain or the alpha chain. The green would be called the beta chain or the B chain. <laughs> and what we know about insulin is that it's, it's highly conserved across vertebrates. If you were to compare the 
structure and the amino acid sequence of insulin from a human to that of a cow or to that of a pig, you'd see that there's a very high uh, similarity among the different insulins. In fact, you know, in the modern day today, we, we use recombinant human insulin uh, to, to treat patients with diabetes, but it wasn't that long ago where porcine insulin, insulin from the pig, or bovine insulin, insulin from the cow, was used with efficacy in diabetics, right? So uh, if we think about insulin and, and its discovery there in the 1920s as the anti-diabetic agent, uh, we were... You know, med medicine was using insulin from uh, pig and from cow long before recombinant DNA technology was uh, uh, was popularized. Okay, but these days it's uncommon in the U.S. to see animal sources of insulin to treat diabetes. These days, uh, recombinant human insulin uh, is primarily what's used, and we'll we'll talk more about it. But talking now about how the body makes insulin makes it as a pro hormone. So if we look at this structure, <laughs> we see that insulin is actually made um, as a longer pro-hormone. This one is called pre-pro-insulin. Uh, the pre-domain is actually what we call, uh, contains what we call a signaling sequence, uh, which helps target it to um, the, right, the right place within the beta cell. Okay? Pre-pro-insulin is going to be cleaved into pieces first cleavage is going to involve the green part going away, the signal sequence. The second part is going to involve this yellowy orange structure, which we call the C-peptide, um, going to be cleaved. Right. So in the first step, pre-pro-insulin is cleaved to pro-insulin. And the pro-insulin is longer than insulin. It's, it's still not insulin. It, it has to be processed further. And when it's processed further, you're going to see removal of the yellow section called the C-peptide. And what's going to be left behind is the alpha and the beta chain um, kind of uh, associating with each other through these sulfur groups. And which amino acid is, um, you know, giving that sulfur atom to interact with the other sulfur atom? Do you know which amino acid that is? All right, that's cysteine, right? So we have these disulfide bonds mediated by cysteine, cysteine interaction. And so the mature form of the hormone, insulin, is an alpha and a beta chain linked together by two disulfide bonds. And it's important to know this because we're going to start to talk about some of the rapid-acting and some of the long-acting insulins, um, and we're going to look for uh, differences in either the alpha or the beta chain. So you should feel comfortable knowing the insulin comes to us from a pre-pro hormone, gets cleaved to a pro hormone, gets cleaved to the active hormone insulin. And what's left behind is the C-peptide. And for what um, for what we know about C-peptide, we, we don't know it to have a, a physiological function to the present time. But it is produced in a ratio of one to one. One molecule of insulin for each molecule of C-peptide. I'm not talking about C-reactive protein, that's something else. This is the C-peptide part of the uh, pro-insulin that has to be removed to form the active insulin molecule. Now, insulin is a protein, right? So it's going to float around in the blood and approach target tissues. We saw that in terms of uh, major targets. We see things like the fat and the skeletal muscle and the liver. But it's a protein, so it's not like just diffusing into the cells of those target tissues, but rather it's, it's approaching the cell membrane and binding to receptors, which we call insulin receptors. And this figure shows you a typical um, caricature of the insulin receptor. It's what we call a receptor tyrosine kinase, which is uh, a type of receptor that we we know other growth factors also possess. As you can see, uh, there's a lipid bilayer there. Let's say it's on the surface of a skeletal muscle cell. Um, you have an extracellular alpha hormone binding domain and an intracellular beta tyrosine kinase domain. 
Now here I'm not talking about the alpha and the beta chain of insulin, right? That That's the agonist of this receptor. This receptor has two alpha subunits on the outside, two beta subunits on the inside, and when it's activated by insulin, it's going to start to phosphorylate things because it's a receptor, tyrosine kinase. Okay, one of the things that's going to phosphorylate is a substrate called IRS, which we're going to see in the next slide. All right, so don't get confused. There's an alpha and a beta chain in insulin, the actual protein. And then there's an alpha and a beta subunit in the receptor. The alpha subunit faces the outside of the target cell, the extracellular environment. The beta subunit is the kinase domain, and it's found on the inside of the cell. And in fact, this receptor is drawn as a dimer because when insulin binds it and stimulates it, it forms a dimer or two receptors side by side working together as a kinase. And so if we now look at the same picture, but now extend it a little bit to show you, at the very top, the insulin molecule binding to the receptor, right? And we see that this dimer that forms becomes an active kinase. That's what that yellow star is trying to tell you in the above portion. And now substrate comes up to that receptor called IRS, which happens to have a tyrosine within its structure. And that Look at what happens when it comes out of the kinase, right? It comes out phosphorylated. And that phosphorylated IRS is going to be active and have impact on, on other signaling pathways, such as the PI3 kinase pathway or the MAP kinase pathway, which um, we'll discuss in more detail in, in the next set of slides.